Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Who clicked start broadcast? I don't believe it. Not guilty. No, oh, sorry, Lassie, you started the broadcast and you shouldn't have done that. Oh, well. Hello, audience. Uh, we haven't started the broadcast yet, although you're probably able to hear me. Hopefully, you can see on your screen the agenda for tonight's meeting. And we're just trying to contact uh, the presenter just so that he can share his screen and we can do the presentation in around about 10 minutes' time. Meantime, sit tight, uh, enjoy your drink if you have one, and we'll get back to you in a bit. In some new machines, methods we can use with uh, with maintenance renewals. Oh, uh, see if we can move that out of there. And that's the feedback from your mark. You may need to mute your laptop audio if you're going to use yeah. Apple. Okay, you see the presenter page now? Yes, thank you. Yeah, okay. So we'll start there. Uh, up put some examples from Falkirk uh, pictures here and there into the presentations as well. Um, but first of all, we're going to start just talking about the, the railway and how it works. Uh, our core, core business is, is based on 95% of full vacuum. So we, we, we've been uh, de delivering these machines throughout Europe uh, for 27 years, uh, delivering works, and and uh, and 12, 12 of them have been working in the UK. 
So the, the main thing about the rail, like it, it allows to work with a truck in situ uh, without damaging cables or infrastructure. So, so we see it as a kind of mobile rail excavation machine that gives up the opportunity to, to hand back quick and uh, have <coughs> good production rates. <laughs> so we're going to start just talking through the machine here. Uh, at the front we have a manip manipulator arm. This is uh, operated by an uh, one operator. Uh, next one is uh, this is a storage capacity for um, for uh, waste ballast. It's about approximately 18 to 20 cubic meters per per load in one rail rack. Behind that, we got a filter system. It's a HEPA filter type. So it's a, it's a really fine dust particle that filters through that. Behind that is two engine bays, cat engines. Underneath, we got two uh, static driving wheels. Uh, within the procession, a rail rack is uh, it becomes an OTM machine. So you haul a rail rack into site as uh, as a rail, more basically a regular wagon, and then the operator sets it up to an OTM machine within the procession. Uh, for uh, discharging material uh, on site, off site. We have deflector plates that uh, push the material out to the side. And here we have uh, <clears throat> the range of the machine, the standard range as a nozzle from the from the rail. Then, so uh, we through the last twelve years in, in UK, we have been doing most of most of it is rebalancing SLC wet beds. Uh, good experience there. <clears throat> uh, a lot of it is also working around uh, cables, moving cables, lowering cables, changing cables if that's necessary. I, I, I mentioned it, I think it's a good a good idea to to have the versatility of the machine and, and uh, not only the rebalancing or or uh, renewal part of it of a uh, yeah, rebalancing site. Set path construction and repair, uh, sleeper replacement. Uh, we also work uh, under live uh, overhead and uh, ALO. Uh, trial holes for mass locations, trucks insulation, material clearance, uh, chamber UTX, uh, drainage work. Yeah, and this uh, nozzle, we, we can also extend to, to the length we, were, we will require that on that. So, track in situ, uh, to the right there, we have a picture of uh, the site in, in Falkirk, uh, Grainmont, uh, the site we did uh, in May 2019. It was, uh, I believe, it was eight pointers plus some plain line works so over five weeks. We did up there with uh, with a 300 mil dig throughout all the whole site. So we worked about two uh, two shifts per weekend, and and uh, we also used four shift uh, midweek on that. So this is the uh, methodology we used there. We we ramped in um, and ramped out from for, for each each section. Um, and I'll show a bit earlier the importance of this uh, ramping. But uh, more or less, it will mean that uh, that we we calculate the ramp from 30 300 mil down to 50 mil or or to zero, so we get a smoother transition. Uh, and it looks like this. 
uh, a traditional way uh, before 2017 we uh, we pushed away the sleepers to make this uh, rampant transition smoother uh, today we have something called the Russell 360 attachment on the on the rail deck and this uh, this machine uh, uh, it's rotating. It's a, it's a kind of rotating, rotating nozzle that cuts under the sleeper instead of moving the sleeper. I'll show that in the movie later. And this is, uh, this is the result of no ramping in, and now you get a pretty hard transition there. <clears throat> so, uh, like I said, Russell. Uh, this is a suction hose, uh, rotate, hy hydraulic rotating, with a kind of tooth on that uh, that scratches under the sleeper, and make a smooth foundation. So I'll, I'll sh show you a short video. But it's, uh, I'm not sure how the sound will work, but we'll see. This is also something that will that will keep the foundation hard instead of us scratching up uh, further down than we need to, so we don't damage the foundation below. Uh, <clears throat> uh, having an accuracy and having uh, being able to uh, flatten and, and smooth cross fall uh, is important for the for the quality of the of the work we do. Uh, next stage uh, at uh, at uh, Greymouth, we we use tarim uh, in sections, uh, yeah, then to prevent clay or uh, or uh, other fine material to to get into the stone. Then uh, our method of uh, backfilling with with new stone has been for 11 years in the UK uh, an ROV with with uh, a bucket head and and unloading from wagons in 2018 we brought in this ballast feeder that we all stuck in uh, grain mouth uh, and this enabled us to to follow the production rates uh, for for the rail back then and uh, uh, the key, the key for us has always been to to have the nozzle in the ground all the time, no downtime, waiting on backfilling or consolidating in between. So this is kind of key for us to to increase our production. Uh, it works more or less like an MFS system, but uh, it has precision drop and it's a self-propelled machine. So it's it's one operator driving the the belt feeder feeding back in. <clears throat> So a bit a bit on the belt feeder there. The the conveyor belt is from zero to, to seven meters drop, uh, 180 degrees side to side, uh, and the feeder belt can lower and raise. So uh, raise so you can feed into uh, another wagon in front. And this you can do with pea gravel. You can with with, with sandstone uh, for for drainage purposes as well.
And this is a short video of that system in operation. We'll show later uh, a video as well that was, uh, where we used the very like in Dallas page on the renewal site. So you see the whole picture. And it's 45 tons, that's uh, each wagon. So uh, you can add on, if you want 10 wagons, you could add on how many you want them. And I believe this is a safe, safe way to, to handle ballots. And uh, it will also, on our side, you, will, uh, you wouldn't have need for the RRV. So the idea is to have a one-stop shop uh, arriving by rate, which you can have a Quick setup uh, within 15 minutes. You work and you could pack it down within within the same time, 15 minutes. Uh, but between the process, uh, the sections, we we do like um, uh, eight, ten base uh, before we consolidate and do a new section eight to ten base and on and on, depending on how how long we can keep on working in shift. Uh, and at the end, then after uh, uh, after the project is done, if possible, we we uh, attempt to design uh, or DTS them. So uh, in grade mode, we worked for five weeks, uh, consolidated with, with robles, maintained, and then at the end ordered the tamper to do the first section and then continue on. Uh, to the finish. So uh, we just calculated a quick, quick uh, the production rates had um, a production time each shift each weekend uh, around five hours and around two and a half. No, sorry, one and a half to two hours production time midweek and. Uh, I think I believe the average output was 20 beds per hour. Uh, some we did uh, 30, uh, up to 40 for uh, one and a half hour, but uh, yeah, that, that's not we can calculate with that for average. So this is the video of the traditional way uh, using RRVs. Um, and and actually the way we deliver in sites uh, the weekend uh, large On 
det är fight med uh, just det är en bra about 54 That's efficient way to do it at the same time as you are developing it. Well.
So that was that movie. I also have a, I have a new. Uh, I use a lot of movies in this one. <laughs> I wasn't also sure how it's going to be, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, the new method now. Uh, I'll, I'll I borrow the movie from our sister company in uh, in Sweden uh, that have been uh, using this method for twenty years uh, using this uh, uh, ballast feeder wagons. Feeding directly into uh, into the dig then and, and uh, following the production rates of the railback. And also, when you when you discharge ballast from a ballast feeder, you get the stone you get uh, directly underneath the sleeper. So you you will uh, from the start with you will have a tighter consolidation. So you you will save time on the consolidating between the sections, and the rail will also uh, stay in position. So you don't have to lift it so much uh, when when you go over with the with the damper. Of course, we also uh, use jacks uh, as well as uh, if we do like a ten. 10 bay section we use jacks to hold it up to to be sure but uh this also helps holding the track up
So this is the, the excavation and backfilling part. Uh, this is a concept where we are working on to, to get rid of the, uh, the spoil. So the idea on, on this concept is uh, we, we actually built a demo wagon of this to, 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 to show as well. But the concept will be that to lower uh, so small unit bins, containers on the side, Cessna six foot. Uh, and, and and prep it up with two or three wagon sets uh, on, on the railway site, and then bring the railway back after uh, every time we fill up twenty cubic, and bring it back, discharge, go back in, and and continue uh, excavation. So we have this this nozzle in the ground all the time at maximum uh, production time. And this also saves uh, uh, double handling on site. Uh, no RV, and we then again get the system in uh, in one train, and then unpack in 10, 15 minutes, ready to go. So that, that's the idea to, to get the product, product, product productivity up because the the possessions we get are uh, they are not getting any longer. So uh, it's more and more busy. So we need to develop all the time to. To get the productivity up. Uh, a short, uh, short movie here as well on uh, on the system on the demonstration area uh, at Ray Live. I believe this this was 2018. Then again, this is a concept, a way we could do it in the future. Uh, so it's not finalized. So we have, uh, I, I would say this is like 10% and uh, just an idea of what, what could be done. But um, bringing everything in by rail and out by rail is, uh, is a safe way to, to get machines and people uh, working safe. So. Uh, and without the, the risk of damaging anything on off tracking machines, etc. This is this this is the only I mean a one one stop shop uh, without RRDs inside them. <clears throat> so we'll only have to uh, to to bring uh, some manpower with the with the robot out and fight uh, a gang of. Uh, Eight men on site to consolidate and uh, and then uh, tamp it and follow up work on it. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of movies. Uh, uh, okay, but uh, I believe this is one of the last ones I got uh, to show you. And and this is uh, I brought this along because it's yeah it's. Uh, <laughs> It's relevant today. It's uh, it's a, it's a rail vac, but it's battery driven. So it's uh, it's the, it's the first uh, first and largest battery powered uh, railway machine. 
maintenance machine. So I thought this was uh, this re relevant in the, at this topic. So I will launch this uh, as well. It's uh, it's a Swedish uh, spoken movie, uh, but it's texted as well, so you you will get the, the get the information texted there. So we'll, uh, we'll do that. This uh, this was launched at our uh, at our workshop uh, up in north in Sweden, where we build uh, snow machines. Uh, where where we build all of our railbacks. It's uh, the main main workshop in Norway. Yeah. Uh, this machine does the same thing. Uh, it's a bit more powerful. Uh, and it's totally silent, so it's. Uh, but then, of course, no no exhaust, and uh, it's, it's perfect for working in tunnels, mines, uh, underground, similar. So it's important for us to, to look at new, new opportunities and, and uh, possible solutions for, for old problems. And that's, uh, that's the core of our company, that's uh, invention. Starting with Wacky. So I believe that was the last one. Uh, I hope it was worth the time. So if you have any questions, it's, uh, my information is there. Uh, and uh, then over to you, Tom. Thank you, Lasse. We, we had uh, a couple of questions asked uh, by members of the audience. Uh, Daniel Woods was asking, what was the length of ramp and in the same vein Patrick Dixon asked, are the ramp transition length the same as a design ballast, uh, ballast ramp, i.e. line speed divided by six? So if the line speed was 60 miles an hour, well, the ramp would be a 10 meter ramp. Did you, did you just yeah, ramp it in, yeah. do you have a design length? No, no we, we use a scale like, like that. Uh, we have a diagram to, to show the the length of the dig um, and the handbag speed and so if if let's say it was uh, don't don't write this in stone but ex example let's say it was um, a 50 mile hack we will do then do maybe an 11 12 base band on that one something like that but but um, we we do calculate the ramps uh, at our sites. Okay, but sometimes the designer is required to specify a ramp length uh, in the real standards and the empirical formula that's used is line speed divided by six. But you use a different hmm. formula to create your ramp based no, on no, your uh, we, speed. We, we, we always follow uh, the tech on site standards or, or requests. Ah, okay. Thanks so we, we have a methodology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and a it's, question. Uh, Sorry, you go, Lassie. No, no, apologies. No, no, it's just uh, to, to clarify. We we always follow the the client's uh, re requests. Well, we we are not a, a principal contractor. We more or less like uh, we we rent out uh, the tools for for uh, for network rail or the client to do the job. Okay.
So my question on yeah. the creation of the ramp is, how is the ramp depth controlled on site? So well, you obviously start at sleeper soffit level, and you go from there to 300 mil deep over a distance. But how is the control done on site? Is it by uh, by the operator's eye? Does he guess it, or does he have a? No, uh, the tech will will then control the ramp and the depth of the dig. So we do that every if it's required every two meters, the tech controls the depth every two meters. That that goes with the crossfall as well. So does he stop and take a dip? Does he yeah, take a measure? Uh, Yes, yes, he records it and then take notes. Uh, the railway works in, an, uh, in a rebelting type, it works uh, backwards. So uh, the further the railway goes, you will always have space to take measurements before the new ballast goes in. So you will always more or less have, a, have, a, have eight or 10 bays open for uh, the tech to go in and, uh, and measure the depth. And if there was a correction, active action needed, you can come back and take out more. Yes, yes. We we also have the reach of the nozzle. We can reach pretty far, and that's that's why we or usually do like eight bed bait. But then we can go back and do the correction. Okay, another if question required. for me. For me, then you mentioned laser control. Do you have a, the ability to fit a laser receiver to the to the nozzle? Yeah, it, it's possible to receive uh, to to do that to mount uh, laser receivers, uh, and it's it, it's more or less uh, possible for all RRVs, everything to to mount that. We haven't done that yet. Uh, um, or the site has has been controlled by measuring either with uh, either with laser or uh, using references around the track, maybe the opposite track, and then have a laser over there and, and physically measuring. Uh, a control point uh, at rail. Okay. So on your answer, on your question, uh, yes, it's possible, but we haven't mounted it. Okay. My question I have on the, and this is the last one for me, honest. Uh, uh, you, you talked about the Rosal 360, your rotating head. How how is that mm -hmm. powered? Is it powered through the vacuum, or is it powered independently? Uh, it, it's it's powered by a uh, hydraulic, so it's like a tooth um, rotating wheel with a tooth on. Right, so there was a. So it's, it's a hydraulic power to it, it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it did look as if it had quite a bit of power on it. Yeah, it's quite a, quite a bit of power. Uh, it's really powerful. So, um, reason we one thing that we chose to, to mount that was, uh, was the surface and the cost and the possibility to, to dig five, five millimeters underneath the sleeper. The other thing was when we have rock hard uh, um, wet beds, for example, we, we use this tooth on this rotating nozzle to, to scratch in and then make a, make a hole to, yeah, to, to crack, crack the hole open more or less. Yeah. Okay, one from John Campbell now. It says the video suggests handback at line speed. So I think you were talking about line speed handbacks, and I think you mentioned DTS with a question mark. Uh, John's question yeah, is about well, limitations dependent on the dig depth. So are you prevented from line speed handback depending on how deep you dig? Yeah, it, it, that, that's uh, individual from side to side. Um, most uh, sites with deliver uh, might have a, a restriction on to be maintained or for the tamper to get on that might might be a week or or some between that we need to maintain the site afterwards but but then again this is a uh, network grade maintaining it so um, yeah uh, wait, uh, waiting for the tamper to go, to go on and then, then hand back at uh, at line speed so Traditionally, when we talk about line speed handback, it's line speed as part of the core works. So you would have typically a tamper and DTS cyclic after the, the new ballast is installed to allow uh, no temporary speed restriction afterwards. Have you been involved in, in those types of scenarios? Uh, we're not so much involved in, in that part of it. It's uh, um, 
it's, it's not our part of the work to 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 do this follow up and and, uh, and maintaining. But uh, I know it's it's handed back in 50 miles per hour, uh, and I, I I believe it's handed back faster than that as well. But to say it's uh, always handed back at line speed, uh, uh, I can I can answer on that one. Okay, and then just an observation for me, not a question, but you mentioned uh, taking trial holes for uh, foundations to almost like to do ground investigation work. Uh, is that something mm, you, yeah. uh, you're exploring more in the future? Because uh, ground investigation work, digging trial holes is a bit intrusive uh, in the railway and it's not always mm. done done very quickly, but your machine looks as though it would be able to excavate a trial hole to a, a, some serious amount of depth, five meters deep. Um, yeah, you can ask, you can the, ask the, to do that activity. Yeah, we, we've been uh, been uh, working on different projects here and there, um, doing trial holes. I believe we did something for Wales a while back, and. Uh, the thing here is all the trial holes. Yeah, it's a quick, quick, uh, quick hole to dig for the railway. We we might do that uh, one meter wide, one meter deep in uh, one to two minutes. Something like that depending on the material. If it's clay, it's maybe five minutes. But uh, you need to have uh, you need to have quite a lot of holes to make this cost efficient, probably. But it, it's definitely an easy safe way of digging a hole uh, on the railway. Uh, because if we should meet a cable or a pipe or we'll, we'll, we'll be able to, yeah, excavate around it without uh, harming the, the, the pipe or cables around it. Okay. So yeah, uh, to answer, this is something we will, uh, we'll, we'll do if we will be, we will be asked to do it, so. Yeah, I've, I've no more typed questions. What I'm going to do is a bold move. I'm going to unmute everybody. Um, let's try and see if this works. <laughs> okay, so I think I've unmuted you all, audience. And somebody unmute their microphone and say hello. Unmuted. Seems to be working. Yeah, good. So anybody with any questions, please, uh, for Lassie. And if that's a no, yeah. then... Uh, uh, just so Sorry, just for you, it's uh, Pat Dickinson here from the Manchester section. Um, you did mention that you, can, you were achieving 20 beds per hour. Is that 20 beds of plane line or is that 20 beds within the SNC? Sorry, Lassie, I can't hear you. You can, you can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now, Lassie, yeah. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, where was I? Uh, I, I took an average of the site diaries. Uh, we had um, we had one and a half hour. We did the forty six uh, beds. This was also in an SSC, but I believe the ma site manager there did calculate uh, a, a wide barrier as two beds. So, so uh, an average of, on twenty uh, when everything is uh, working well in production at uh, at Falkirk. When when I uh, travel around and, and sell the production rate, we we uh, we sell around ten base per hour production rate, and this is because it's always some downtime uh, waiting for ROE to backfill, uh, logistics on site, etc. So a more uh, a more right rate to broadcast is is ten base per hour uh, production. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Any more questions? And I'll ask Greg to propose the vote of thanks then, members. 
Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks, Lassie. Um, well done for not letting the, the technical issues phase you at the start. It's uh, easy to throw you into a panic, but you handled that admirably, so well done. Um, also, you score maximum points for choosing a site in Scotland uh, for your presentation with the Falkirk one, so that was great. Um, obviously, Thanks. a great piece, of, great, great piece of kit, and uh, you talked us through the benefits of it. Um, to me, an obvious main advantage was the fact that, you know, the safety factor of avoiding damaging cables as you're hoovering the ballast rather than penetrating it with uh, the blade of a bucket, so uh, it's, it's obviously a great safety advantage there. I thought it was also good to see it's, it's a one-stop shop in terms of the ability. You know, you said that you could supply 45 tonnes per wagon. You're, you're rebalancing mm -hmm. as well and also able to take the spoil uh, away. So it's not as if it's one operation but requires two follow-up things to do it. It's kind of it's all done in the one, one, um, with the, with the one piece of kit. So uh, the footage you showed I thought was excellent as well. It's, it's, it's one thing describing an operation like that, but being able to see it in action uh, really brings it to life. And it was really high quality video you, you showed us on that. Um, uh, just a few observations from me as well. So I think that being able to rebalance the SNC and keeping it in situ, if you like, is a great thing. And it, it must save a lot of time with possession access and it, and it reduces the risk as well of you're not lifting out the S and C and, and having a, a panic of problems getting it back in at the at the end. Uh, and and the, the new method you mentioned even helps that further by uh, using jacks to maintain the track level during the operation, and that reduces the amount of lift required by the tamper and the, the consolidation time as well. So that was all good. It, Molly, um, only one thing that drawn stuck in my mind was a concern that if, I think others have mentioned that. If the DTS wasn't available or able to be used due to site restrictions, it might, um, you know, cause a speed restriction that could go on. Maybe, maybe, perhaps, sometimes further than a, than a traditional method. That I don't know, but just something um, that crossed my mind. Um, lastly, I'll just say, you know, well done I, to you guys for the, the battery powered MPV you showed us. Um, you know, in these times, while everyone's striving for decarbonisation and stuff, that's that's a real step forward. So that looked that looked great. And I'll, I'll just probably finish up at that. To be honest, I think we'll try and do um, a kind of usual way of thanking you if, if everyone's unmuted. But if, if that fails, I'll just finish anyway by saying yeah, thanks very much, Lassie, for the excellent presentation. Yeah, thank you. Th th thank you for having me. It's uh... <laughs> it's really good. Been really good. So, okay. Uh, yeah. Any questions in the future? Just uh, yeah. Let me know. So, uh, I'm really happy to to be be invited. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, hopefully, you should be able to see the the agenda again. And I'll just say thanks to Angus McGregor, aka Greg McMillan, for doing both. Thanks. Uh, and note that the up and coming section meetings, uh, Edinburgh don't appear to have one in December, which is, I was looking for one. But our next meeting at Glasgow Section PWI, which will also be a webinar and available on the web afterwards, is grandly entitled Delivering the Scottish Minister's Requirement for Gauging in Control PH6. He presents a guy called TBC from Network Rail in Scotland. And by the 16th of December, we will find out who that guy actually is. And it only leaves me to say thank you for attending tonight, folks. And the networking reception should, it should be carried on in the, the manner that we normally do. And it's courtesy of yourselves. Thank you. And I'll bring the presentation to a close. Thanks again.